Hi, I'm Todd Austin, and this is part two of my hardware security video tutorial series, which has six parts in it. And in this part, we'll be talking about security basics. To become a hardware security expert, you've got to understand the basics of security. And so we're going to spend time in this particular unit talking about cryptography, hashing, and signatures. If you haven't watched the first part of this series, where we set the stage, why hardware security and security in general is important, uh, please go back and watch that. It's linked to in this uh, in the description for this video. Uh, after we get done with learning the basics, then we're going to go off and study what is basic hacking, both hardware and software hacking. Uh, what are side channels and how do they occur? Then we're going to spend some time looking at existing security defenses and how they often fall short. And then the final sixth part of the series, we'll be talking about, we'll be taking a tour of emerging defenses, including some of my own work at University of Michigan. So let's get started. Today, we're going to talk about cryptography. Cryptography is the basis for most strong security mechanisms. In fact, I like to tell my students that there's only one superpower in the world of security, and that is cryptography. Cryptography it involves ciphers, and ciphers have the ability to take information and turn them into pure random data. So let's, let's start by looking at what a cipher is. A cipher is an algorithm where you give it information that is readable. We call that plain text. And then using a key transforms that into something that has no information in it. We call that ciphertext. What does it mean to have no information in the ciphertext? It means to a uh, data scientist, there's no way to distinguish between pure random data and your encrypted data. And so by definition, there is no information in it. Now, of course, there is information in it, but you can't retrieve that information unless you have the key to decrypt that information, producing again the original plain text. In the world of cryptography, we have two primary forms of cryptography, symmetric key cryptography, where the same key is used to encrypt and decrypt, and we have asymmetric key cryptography, where two different keys are used to encrypt and decrypt. On this slide, we see the basics of symmetric key cryptography. I have one key that can both encrypt the data, and then the person that wants to see that encrypted data can use that same key to decrypt that piece of information. Uh, we often call this a private key. Cipher examples are things like AES, which is the US encryption standard, DES, which is the previous US encryption standard, Blowfish, which is a popular open source uh, implementation, Simon, which is another popular uh, hardware-based cipher. Now, one of the challenges with this particular kind of cryptography is while being very secure, it creates a problem where, how do I share my private key with the receiver if I'm sending them encrypted data? I mean, I may need another channel. Did you ever uh, try to send an encrypted piece of information to a friend over email? And then maybe in another email, you send them the uh, the um, password in the clear and say, hey, that email I sent you five minutes ago, uh, here's the password on how to decrypt that, that email. That's not a very secure approach. And that really is a challenge with symmetric key cryptography. How do we uh, share these private keys with each other so that we can do uh, communication over an encrypted channel? Let's take a little deeper look at these symmetric key crypto algorithms. And they all kind of look very similar. They take this plain text and a secret key and they run a sequence of what are called rounds. And what rounds are doing is they're algorithmic code that's trying to take each bit of the input and distribute it across all the bits of the output. So that ultimately, any bit in the plain text gets distributed equally across all the bits in the output. 
the order and distribution of how that input bit is distributed to the output is a function of the secret key and key expansion uh, figures out how to do this. So these rounds, the more of these rounds you have, the more uh, swizzling and, and mutating of information occurs in the uh, between the plain text and the cipher text. And typically you'll see, um, you know, uh, ciphers will be specified by their round count. Like, oh, we're running an AES with 10 or 14 rounds. And in general, the more rounds there are, uh, the more uh, secure that algorithm, the more harder it is to break that algorithm. In fact, one of the uh, key aspects of designing a new algorithm is figuring out how many rounds makes that secure. Uh, so in essence, what a symmetric key crypto algorithm does is it takes the input information and then redistributes it in part across all the bits on the output. In fact, you know, one of the definitions of a strong cipher is you can flip any bit on the input and it flips all the output bits with probability 50%. Now, which bits flip is determined by the key that you put in. Uh, these are fantastic algorithms. And I'll just add, you know, if you're a computer architect or a compiler developer and you concern yourself a lot with parallelism, you'll notice that when, when I said uh, flip any single input bit, and it flips all the output bits with 50%, what you'll notice is that uh, that kind of suggests there's not much parallelism in these ciphers because any input affects all the outputs. And that's really the case. That there's very little parallelism in strong encryption ciphers. And so you end up, if you want to accelerate these operations in hardware or in software, you end up having to write more efficient, as in do less work, code or hardware, you can't just simply parallelize uh, this, these efforts. Now, when you encrypt a piece of data, you get it's a deterministic process. So you get a piece of plain text in, you get the same ciphertext out for the same plain text in. And this uh, necessitates the need for something called chaining. But first, let's take a look at what happens when you don't have chaining. When you don't have chaining, you notice that uh, same input in, same input out. And so what we've done here, we've taken the Linux Penguin here and we've used a strong cipher and we've encrypted it without chaining. And you can actually, see, you don't have to be a data scientist or a cryptographer to know that without chaining, there's information in this cipher text here. You could actually see the penguin in the cipher text because the same pixel over here results in the same cipher text over here. And so there's a correlation between the inputs and the cipher text. What chaining tries to do is to break that correlation. So the output looks like this, that as we change the inputs, as we have repetitions in the inputs, it doesn't have repetitions in the outputs. In fact, if any bit here changes, it changes all the remaining bits in the encryption with probability of 50%. And that requires chaining. The way we implement chaining, there's really two basic approaches to implement chaining. One is to change the, chain the entire uh, encryption algorithm, where you take the plain text of the first piece of information you want to encrypt, you encrypt it, and then you take the output of that encryption, the ciphertext, and you XOR it with the next plain text that you want to encrypt, and then you encrypt it, and on and on and on. And again, architects and compiler designers, you'll notice this and essentially eliminates all parallelism from the entire encryption process. And you know that is uh, very difficult to provide high performance. So this has led to the development of what's, of what's called counter mode encryption. With counter mode encryption, instead of taking the previous ciphertext and XORing against the next plain text, what we do is we encrypt uh, just a counter. We encrypt a counter. So we're encrypting one, two, three, four, and then we're, we're XORing that value with the plain text and then encrypting that. So uh, that and, and XORing that with the plain text to get our encrypted value. That is, uh, you know, is generally a weaker form of encryption, but not so weak that it's not useful and it does break these um, correlations between the inputs and the outputs. Of course, you got to store the counters so that you know how to reproduce that information that you did that, uh, that, that you uh, that you have to store the counter values to decrypt as well. 
but in the end with these chaining and counter modes you get this what you know is appears to be pure random data like there's no correlation here you, you there's no penguin to be found here uh but the the key point to remember here is that um chaining is very important or salting which is another form or tweaking uh these are very important technologies to embrace if you want to make your crypto hard to analyze so that's symmetric key cryptography these are these algorithms that that encrypt and encrypt decrypt the same key and we i mentioned briefly that these algorithms have really a fundamental problem with them in that when two entities want to communicate uh they have to share a key but they can't share the key over the symmetric key channel because it hasn't been established until we share the key so we have to figure out a way to share that key you know i could send you the key i could mail you the key i could walk to your office and whisper it into your ear i mean these are very inconvenient technologies. So what asymmetric key cryptography solves is the problem of how do I share a secret between two persons that have never shared a secret before? And the way it works is, again, we take plain text and we encrypt with a key called the public key to produce ciphertext that can be decrypted by another key. That's why they call it asymmetric key cryptography called the private key. And that produces, again, the plain text. And in the world of public key encryption or public key infrastructure, you might have heard the term PKI, uh, the public key infrastructure. The public key is well known in the world. You know, so when you're, your bank's public key is well known to the world, Google's public key is well known to the world. And there's entities out there called certifying authorities, which their job is to register those keys and make those public keys known. So what I can do to share a secret with someone is I can take my secret and I encrypt it with the public key of whoever I want to share it with. So I get the public key of the entity, my bank, whatever that I want to share it with, and I encrypt it with the public key. And then I know because of this algorithm, you can't decrypt it with the public key. You can only decrypt it, decrypt it with the private key. The private key is held by your bank or whatever entity you're trying to communicate with. And the job there is to not share that private key. There's there's all kinds of infrastructure that you can buy today, like HSMs, hardware security monitors, where you could inject your private keys into them and they're super secure and they make sure nobody can uh nobody in the organization can see those keys because you don't want to you don't want to share your private key with anyone because then they can pretend to be you. So it's very important that the private key never be shared with anyone else. Well, now we have a way of sharing a piece of information with someone else when we didn't know anything in advance. All we need to know is their well-known public key to share directly with them. And then, by the way, the reverse also works as well. And we're going to, spoiler alert, use this to implement signatures. You can take a piece of plain text, encrypt it with the private key, and it can only be decrypted by the public key. And I can, I'll use that to, to do what's called authentication. Now, we call these public key ciphers or PKI, public key infrastructure. Examples are RSA, Diffie-Hellman, Elgamo. And asymmetric key cryptography, it's, it's built on these classic one-way functions. These are functions that are easy to compute in one way and really hard to compute in another way. So RSA, for example, is built on the fact that multiplying factors to get their product is easy. Factorizing the product into the original factors is a classically hard problem that we've studied for 2,000 plus years. And there's a great deal of uh, confidence that no one's going to be able to figure out how to do that quickly in any time. Now enter quantum computing. So quantum computing really becomes a threat to asymmetric key cryptography because quantum computers just so happen to be able to factor large uh, numbers into their primes more easily than classical computers. And so you end up getting uh, these asymmetric key cryptography algorithms that are threatened by quantum computing. So recently, NIST, which is a uh, organization in the U.S. that helps standardize cryptography, has been running these, you know, long-standing competitions to develop post-quantum ciphers. So, what is a post-quantum cipher? It's an asymmetric key cryptographic cipher 
where the one-way function is some function that doesn't happen uh, to be done. It, 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 it's a function that isn't easily done by quantum computers. And so that that process is ongoing now. And, and you know, a lot of those algorithms are based on lattice cryptography. They're not based on, on factoring large numbers, but they still give you this basic uh, infrastructure where you can encrypt with a public key and decrypt with a private key. And so as that changes underneath us, that won't really change what public key uh, encryption does. It'll just make it more resistant to the emergence of quantum computing and, and their capabilities. Now, as I said earlier, the reverse path also works. It's possible to encrypt something with a private key and then only decrypt it with a public key. And we use this to implement authentication. What is authentication? Authentication is trying to figure out, am I really talking to my bank? Am I really talking to my friend? And the way that works is um, we do an authentication process where if I want to talk to my bank, this is me, and I want to talk to my bank, I'm going to create a piece of information and send it to my bank. And then I'm going to ask, oh, let me try that again. I'm going to send that information to my bank. And I'm going to ask the bank, encrypt this with your private key. And that'll create what's called an encrypted signature. They'll send that back to me. I'll decrypt that information and I'll see, did it match what I originally sent them? If it does match what I originally sent them, what do I know? I know that this information I just received was encrypted by the holder of the public key associated with the private key that I that I, I sent the, the entity that I, that I encrypted this data. And so in the end, you end up getting a certification that the entity you're talking to is actually um, is actually your bank. Really useful path to do that. And later we'll see how we can use the same mechanism to build up digital signatures as well. All right. So these asymmetric key cryptos, I mean, they're really powerful that you don't have to share a secret. You can share a secret initially with them and you can use them for authentication as well. I mean, let's just give symmetric key ciphers the boot, right? They do half of what asymmetric key ciphers do. Why do we still care about symmetric ciphers? And the answer is that uh, symmetric ciphers are thousands of times faster than asymmetric ciphers. They're not as capable, but they're really, really fast. And so the world exists with both of these and we use them together to solve different problems, right? We use the asymmetric key ciphers to solve the problem of how do I share a secret so I can switch over to my efficient symmetric key cipher, all right? And then, uh, and and so we want both of these forms of cryptography. A great example to look at is Transparent Layer Security or TLS. This is the protocol used to establish HTTPS connections on the internet. And it uses a combination of asymmetric key and symmetric key ciphers. So the way we're gonna accomplish this protocol, we're gonna set up a protocol that's both capable and efficient is we're going to start by getting the public key of the entity I want to I want to communicate with my bank for instance and uh, I'm going to get the public key you know through public key infrastructure for example and I'm going to take a symmetric key and I'm going to encrypt it with the public key of the bank now where do I get a symmetric key what is a symmetric key a symmetric key is just a random number of the size uh that the keys uh, need to use. And so I have to get a random number. In fact, in um, in the fifth unit of this series, we're going to talk about how do you generate random numbers? Because generating random numbers is how we create keys. And it's very important that we have uh, true random numbers, numbers that cannot be predicted by any means. And so uh, given that infrastructure, we can create a new key at any time by just probing our true random number generator for a piece of, for a secret that's the same size as the key needed by the symmetric key cipher, typically 128 bits or 256 bits. I encrypt that with a public key of the server, and then I send that encrypted message to the server. The server just decrypts it with its private key, which it's holding. And then it looks to see that, oh, this is a new connection. This is the symmetric key I should use. 
So then it creates what's called a finished message, which is just a, you know, it's, it's a piece of information that sums up all we've discussed in the past. And then it encrypts that message with the symmetric key that it's just unsealed and sends it back to the client. And then the client decrypts that with a symmetric key. And the client knows that if it can decrypt that message and it contains the information that it expects, which is a, a summary of our previous communications, it knows a couple of things. One, I'm talking to my bank because I use the public key to encrypt that previous message. And as long as the bank hasn't shared its private key with anybody, uh, this message I just got must have come from the holder of the private key associated with that public key. And so now the other thing I know is we both have the symmetric key. So we now shift over to symmetric key cryptography. And so for the remainder of the session, which is typically up to like two hours, we'll be communi communicating with that key when the session expires after a certain amount of time. We just do this authentication again, share another key, and then continue on. So it's a really convenient way to get both performance and capability by combining these asymmetric key crypto cryptography with symmetric key cryptography. Let's take a look at hash functions. Hash functions are so useful. Uh, and cryptographic hash functions are doubly useful. These are functions that can take an arbitrary amount of data, like Shakespeare's common works. You apply the hash function to them, and they create a almost unique identifier for that information. And that identifier is fixed length, typically 128 bits or 256 bits. Think of it like a fingerprint for this information. And a cryptograph, and we can use that to index a hash table, for instance. A cryptographic hash has a couple other really unique properties. One is it's one way, which means that if I create a hash value of dead beef, bad, bad food here, finding the information that created that value is order two to the L, where L is the number of bits in the hash complexity. What does that mean? That means if I just have the hash value and I don't have the information that created the hash value, creating another piece of information that creates that same hash value is like searching from a two to the 128 space or a two to the 256 space. It's essentially impossible for a cryptographic hash. What I need to create that value again is I need the original information. That's called the one-way feature. These are also strongly collision-free. And what that means is if I have a piece of information, I send it into the hash function, where it ends up on this 0 to 2 to the 128 different possible outcomes or 2 to the 56, 2 to the 256 possible outcomes is uniformly distributed. And that the probability of two things colliding is you know, one over two to the 128. That means that this fingerprint is essentially a unique identifier for this piece of information. Examples of hash functions out there are like SHA-1 or SHA-2. MD5 is also a hash function, but it's today considered cryptographically weak because there are algorithms with enough compute power can reverse the one-wayness of these functions. And then there's non-cryptographic hash functions like FNV or CRC64. And these don't have the, they may have the collision-free property, but they don't have the one-way aspect. So it's actually with these algorithms, since they're not cryptographic, it's pretty easy to find another piece of data that makes the same hash. So you know, if, if you don't want people to forge hashes, you have to use a cryptographic hash. You have to be aware of that. SHA-1, SHA-2, awesome. They do this. Monday, Tuesday through Sunday, every day. And they're very effective at it. In fact, I'll just say that, that the one-way aspect of modern hash functions is so powerful and difficult to overcome that Bitcoin mining is a partial solution to the one-way uh, aspect of, of, of the hash functions. In fact, so Bitcoin mining is, is not saying... Uh, find this 256 bit hash. It's fine. It's saying find 40 bits of this 256 hash. You don't have to match the rest. And even that, you know, 
takes you know you know takes the entire world consuming as much energy as the state of new york to occasionally find a solution to that problem so suffice it to say uh, modern hash functions their one way property is 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 working very well people are not defeating that in any manner and they're highly incentivized to defeat it because that means creating bitcoins at a much higher rate let's take a look at an application of hash functions and the classic application to look at is how we store passwords on websites today you know websites with good security practices never store passwords in fact, if you ask a website for your password and it sends you your password back, by definition, that pass that website has poor security practices. They should never store your password. They should store a hash of your password, where they basically take your password, hash it with a cryptographic hash, and store the cryptographic hash in a file. Now, why would they do this? Because if someone hacks into that system and steals the password file, they don't get the passwords they get the hashes of the passwords. And so then the attacker still has to figure out what these hashes match. And they do try to do this using what are called rainbow tables, where they essentially take um, standard approaches for encrypting words and little bits of numbers after the words to try and figure out what your what your password is. And, and they can make huge databases of those things. So, so if your password is guessable, that may be in their database. To try make that more difficult, many you know good security practices ask you to store what's called salt in the password file. So salt is just a random number associated with this entry of the password file, and that random number is attached to the password that's typed in by the user, and then that is hashed. Now, what that does is it makes these rainbow tables and databases not very useful. It forces you to recompute all of that information. So, you know, if you want to see if the, the password is monkey99, then you have to take monkey99, add the salt, which is in the password file. You know what that is. And then you have to rehash that. So it forces you to not just use a database to break this password file, but but, but re, um, recompute that. In fact, this word salt is a common word from crypt cryptographic processing, which means adding a little bit of randomness to decorrelate the output of a of a hash function or a uh, or an encryption, and then just by the way, uh, you know, if a if a if a, a website is using hash passwords with salt, then when you ask it for your password, they're not going to give you a password. They're going to say, "Here's a link that allow you to change your password," because I don't have any idea what your password is. If you forgot it, I can only give you permission to change it, and then they'll store the new hash with the new salt for your password when you decide to change. So now that we understand what hashes are and what um, asymmetric key cryptography is, we can now do digital signatures. So what's a digital signature? This is, I have a document that I want to send to someone and I wanna sign this document electronically. If you've ever done this in, uh, if you've ever done this with like uh, DocuSign or, with uh, Adobe uh, PDF Acrobat, uh, you can sign the document. And if the document changes, then the signature goes away. What's happening there is the document that you want to sign, the system is taking a hash of that document, which forms this fixed 128 or 256-bit signature. It's padding it out to the size that asymmetric key cryptography needs to encrypt, and then it's encrypting it with the private key of the signer. Now, in Adobe, in Adobe Acrobat, what's my private key? This is actually created by Adobe when you install the PDF tools. They're holding both your private key and your public key. Not a great practice, but very convenient. And then uh, when you sign that document, it encrypts the hash under your private key and then just associates it with that document. It's it's passed along with the document. And that's the signature for the document. Now, when someone gets your document, they can check to see if it was signed by you and that the document hasn't been maliciously modified by, again, taking that encrypted signature and decrypting it with your public key, which they can get from Adobe, and then getting a hash 
and then hashing the document that they received and seeing if those two hashes match. If they do, what do they know? They know that you, the uh, person associated with that public key, signed that document because you encrypted it with your private key. And they know that the document hasn't been modified since in its delivery to me because the hash still matches the document that ha matches the hash that was encrypted by the user that signed the document. This is, in fact, more powerful than just signing a physical piece of paper because signing a physical piece of paper, I can go and modify different parts of the document, you know, change the the you know the sense, you know, the truths to the falses and the senses and the, and the logic and such. And you won't know that because there's no analog to message hashing in 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 the real world, really. So very powerful, and again, a useful uh, combination of of hashing and public key cryptography. And then just a quick note on cryptographic engineering. You know, as you go through your career, when you get the urge to create your own cipher, uh, the key here to remember is don't. <laughs> don't create your own cipher. There's actually lots of interesting examples. And two that I'll mention are like the signing, the program signing that was used by the PlayStation when they uh, did digital signatures of their code because the PlayStation would only load code that was signed by an algorithm that was designed uh, by Sony. Another great example are the encryption algorithms used in DDR3 and DDR4 uh, memory encryption. These were cryptographic algorithms that were designed by engineers, not cryptographers. And the way you make a strong cipher is it's, it's not even a single cryptographer makes it. These are made by a community of cryptographers. One cryptographer goes, hey, I got this algorithm. I think it works pretty good with this many rounds. Start beating on it. And after 10 years of beating on it, if no one's broken it, then, hey, I go. this is a great new cipher. Uh, I'll submit it to contests, try to make it standard, you know, et cetera. So uh, that, you know, communities make ciphers, not engineers, especially not engineers that are not um, cryptographers. So if you need a cryptographic mechanism, a cipher or a hash or a signature mechanism, adopt an existing one. There's many well-developed and vetted algorithms out there that are even available without any intellectual property uh, strings attached at all. And so I would encourage you just to remember that when you get that urge in your career to design a new uh, a cipher, if you're not a cryptographer, just an engineer, resist that urge. And that's really important. And then also when you implement things, you got to be very careful about eliminating side channels. And we'll talk more about that later in, in the fourth part of this series. All right. That's all I have today. That's the basics of security, cryptography, hashes, and signatures. We'll be using these things again and again and again throughout this tutorial series. Definitely check out uh, the first tutorial, the first tutorial, uh, the first part of this tutorial, which was the basics of security and privacy. And then, uh, you know, follow on. We can learn more about attacking and defenses and side channels and emerging technologies. Uh, I look forward to seeing you in the in the in the next unit of the series. Uh, and don't hesitate to reach out to me if you've got any questions. I love to interact with uh, my YouTube viewers. So thank you so much. Take care.